going to be continuing our study in Hebrews this evening, covering Hebrews chapter 2, 1 through 4. What was that song again? Hold the song 235. And if you remember, this letter is written to a group of Jews, Hebrews, who are under intense persecution. They've been under, under persecution before, but we notice that they're under persecution, another persecution, and it seems to be more intense. And they're starting to have questions, starting to doubt maybe a little bit. And I can understand that, because if people were coming into my house, taking my things, uh, making a public spectacle out of me, and I had previously been a part of a religion that I believed to be true and was convinced of that. Uh, and all I had to do was go back to that religion. And I knew that religion came from God, so why not just go back to it? I, I can see where they're coming from, especially in such intense per, of persecution. And what Paul's doing here is uh, exhorting them reassuring them, um, pushing them towards not turning their back on Christianity. They, to stand steadfast. And throughout the book, he's laying out in these, this first chapter, first couple chapters, he starts out with why Jesus is superior to the angels. Well, we'll go ahead and read. Actually, I'm going to grab a New King James. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll read verses 1 through 4. I'll probably be swapping back and forth between the English Standard Version and the New King James, but most of you are probably reading the New King James, so I want to have similar language. It says there, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness with both with signs and wonders and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. I'll read it once from the English Standard Version. You might notice some subtle differences. It's just four verses. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to, it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So what we have here is the first of five warning passages that are scattered out through Hebrews. And Paul, at the beginning of this, he gives us, well, first of all, he says, therefore. And we always hear the phrase, what's the therefore, therefore? And that's telling us when he says, therefore, what he's about to say is closely linked to chapter 1. Everything that he just talked about. How Christ is so much superior to the angels in every way. And what this warning is closely related to that. And then actually after this warning, he, goes on, he continues on talking about how Jesus was and why he is superior to the angels. And he gives us the exhortation to pay, that we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. And what things, of course, he's talking to this group of Jews originally. And what were those things that they had heard? It was the facts, the commands, the warnings, and the promises of the good news. Remember back at, at the very beginning of uh, chapter 1, said long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son or through his son whom he appointed the heir of all things. So that's the words that he's talking about here. These things that they have heard is what Jesus had spoke and then what his disciples had 
uh, affirmed that they had heard. But this is what this is also what's designated as later. He calls it in verse three, so great a salvation. So all of these things that he's talking about here, the word that came through the son is encompassed in this so great a salvation. And he tells us to, that we have to pay attention, pay greater attention to. I don't know. A lot of people, they don't like getting into the Greek. They don't like word studies and things like that. But if you think about what we're doing here is when we're studying the Scriptures, we're trying to discern what the writer meant, what the writer's intent was when he wrote it. Not what the verse means to me. What did the writer mean? And so I think it's a, it is sometimes important to get into the words, get into the Greek a little bit, because some thoughts, some ideas can be lost uh, when you translate from one language to another. But he says to pay attention to. Now the Greek word that's translated to pay attention is this. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. But it has a, a double meaning. Um, a, a double idea. Not only does it mean to focus the mind on something, but to also act upon what is perceived. It is actually in Greek literature and secular writings, uh, it's used in reference to bringing a boat into land. It's something that requires a lot of attention. You have to be very careful, but you can't just be looking around you. You also have to drive the boat. You have to react to what you see. I mean, this is something anybody who has ever driven a boat knows how difficult that can be. You know, I, the times that I've gone fishing with Steve or Josh and Hunter out on the boat, I don't pay much attention to what they're doing up there on the trailer motor. But every once in a while it gets a little hairy and I pay attention to what Steve's doing and you've got current pushing you this way, waves pushing you up close to the rocks, he's trying to keep that out while trying to keep the trolling motor out of logs and sticks and everything in there and that's just out with the trailer motor you know, he, people don't just let anybody park their boat on the dock because it's a very precarious uh, maneuver you've got the water pushing you, you've got a propeller going this way and that, the boat floats and drifts back and forth. It, it takes a lot of attention, doesn't it? Especially even more so with bigger ships. And you have to pay attention and you have to act. This isn't something that we have to pay closer attention to and focus our mind, but we also have to act on what we're paying attention to. Our, our actions have to reflect that. He says, so we have to pay closer attention to what we've heard the gospel, lest we drift away. And again, this is another nautical term here in the Greek. And it, it means, uh, you know, if a boat, when, when they drive the boat up to the dock, and they tie it off on the moorings, if it's not securely tied, that boat can drift away. And if you're up in the cabin, and the boat drifts away in the middle of the night, and then it keeps smacking against the rocks, well, then you got to ruin the boat. It's not going to float anymore, right? And that's the idea here. Is of it, it actually have, can have three meanings. That's the first one. The second one is to slip away, kind of like if a if a swimmer is swimming and not being very careful, and they let a ring slip off their finger down into the ocean, and they're not going to get that back. It can mean to slip away, or it can mean to take the wrong course. Uh, maybe if you were eating some popcorn and it went down the windpipe instead of the esophagus. You know, that's something taken the wrong course. That was how it was used in the Greek as well. But all three of these kind of give the same idea. With each version of the word, there's something lost because of a failure to pay attention and to act. So he says, we've got, to, we've got to pay much closer attention and react to what we see and what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. Now, uh, I leaned heavily on the commentary by Gareth Reese in this study. And he says that the application to the readers, the, the original readers of this letter, the warning seems to say to those readers, 
seems to say those readers should not let the persecution and the opposition in Christianity... Let me start over. The warning seems to say to those readers that they should not let the persecution and opposition to Christianity they were facing cause them to quit thinking aright about Jesus, who he is, and how great the gospel is. And he goes on to say, this warning passage has considerable bearing on the matter of the security of the believer. That's the idea of once saved, always saved. The Christian who would make his calling and election sure has an obligation to pay close attention lest he drift away from the things he has heard. Unless the mind is held closely to the words God has spoken, the man will take a wrong course. And again, I, I've had discussions with a lot of people who um, hold the belief of once saved, always saved. And I understand, again, I understand how they get to that scripture using only the verses that they use. But if we're to accept the Bible, the entire Bible, then it can't contradict one another. And it seems painfully clear from these verses that we can drift away. Who's doing the drifting away here? Is, is God pulling away from us because we've been unfaithful? No, that's not the case at all. What did he say? He said, lest we drift away. And he included himself in it. Lest we drift away. So they once had the gospel, they had the salvation, but he's saying, keep pushing, pay close attention, because if you don't, you can drift away. All right, then he goes on. We'll be talking about that there's a penalty for disobedience in the Old Testament. We'll read verse 2. For since the message declared by angels, for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now this is interesting here. He says, the word spoken through angels and that it was proved steadfast. I found this really interesting. He doesn't, he doesn't try to prove the fact that, well, first of all, what's he talking about here? He's talking about the old Mosaic law, right? Because just after it, he says that each disobedience had a just penalty. What's he talking about? The Mosaic law. I think context kind of gives us that there. Um, but he's assuming that his audience knows and understands and accept it, accepts it as fact that angels delivered that Mosaic law or that it was delivered through angels. That kind of struck me as odd because throughout our entire Old Testament study, it never just kind of clicked in my mind. Nothing jumped out to say that God was speaking through an angel when he was giving the law to Moses or that he was speaking through an angel um, maybe in the, uh, in the tabernacle. But it seems here, all the Jews accepted that as fact. They didn't question it. Paul doesn't try to prove that here because he assumes that they know that. Also, in uh, Acts 7 and 53, Stephen makes reference to the fact that the law was ordained by angels at Mount Sinai. And Paul does also in Galatians 3 and 19. So it seems in the, in the New Testament, these Jews at this time that had converted to Christianity or maybe all, all Jews recognized it as fact that the old law, the Mosaic law, and the word came through angels. Now that kind of makes sense of why Paul is spending so much time in chapter 1 and chapter 2 proving that Jesus is superior to the angels. That didn't really make sense to me. To us, it's just common sense. Of course, Jesus is greater than the angels. But in these people's minds, angels held a, held a very high esteem, as they should, because the Mosaic Law came through angels. What Paul's doing here is saying, this message is even greater because this message didn't come through angels. This came through the very Son of God. He says, if the, if the word... 
For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable in the English Standard Version, the same word that's translated here in the New King James, steadfast, can be translated, or is translated confirmed in the next verse. And it's a legal term meaning to guarantee or to validate. And what was confirmed or affirmed is that the law was fully binding and it was fully valid. And then he goes on to say that every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. And there's a little bit of difference there. Why does he say what seems to be the same thing twice? There is a subtle difference in the original language. A transgression is a deliberate breaking of the law, like the man who was going out on the Sabbath and picking up sticks. He was told deliberately not to do that. He knew not to do that, and he did it anyway. A transgression is a deliberate breaking of the law. Disobedience, the word translated disobedience, refers to a failure to hear. Maybe like the, uh, the man that uh, presumptuously touched the things there were some, oh, what was it? No, oh, I lost it. There was a man who would presumptuously or would presumptuously touch something that was uh, the priests were only to touch. And this penalty was the same in both circumstances. There would be stoned to death. But one, the presumption there is because he had failed to hear. Disobedience comes from a failure to hear. So if God calls all, Moses calls all the people together he reads the entire law to him. There's a guy out there thinking about manna and how much he's going to collect. And he's thinking about his cows. He's thinking about his oxen. And Moses is going on, talking, talking, talking up there. He's not paying a lick of attention. And then he doesn't get the full law. He breaks the law because he wasn't listening. God says, that doesn't matter. Disobedience is a failure to hear. We don't have an excuse anymore. So in the Old Testament, whether you deliberately stepped over the line or you stepped over the line because you didn't listen, both of those received a just reward, and that reward was death. Now after God validated the message which angels delivered, Men could not just ignore it and get away with it any, any longer. And then he goes on, and he's making a comparison here. How shall we, and that, that word we in the original language is emphasized. Uh, not sure how all that works, but there's an emphatic we. It's only used five times in Hebrews, and every time that emphatic we is used, it's to make a comparison. So it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We being those who have received this word coming through the Son of God, as opposed to those who had just received the word that had come through angels. There's a contrast there. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And the obvious answer is, we will not escape if we neglect what God has spoken. The punishment for neglecting the Mosaic law was physical death. And the contrast he's making here and the point he's making is that so if the punishment for neglecting the words, the words spoken to us in the last days oh, the point he's making here is that the punishment for neglecting the law of Moses was physical death. So the punishment of neglecting the words spoken to us in these last days through the Son of God will be something even greater than physical death. I was kind of probably kind of mind blowing to them at the time. What could be worse than dying or being stoned to death? That's why we have to pay attention and act. It's an interesting. It's, a, it's interesting, too, that the writer here, he doesn't say reject, but he says neglect. Neglect is the same word that appears in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 5, where the guests made light of or paid no attention to the invitation to the marriage feast. So what must one do to lose 
so great a salvation, you just have to neglect it. Don't pay much attention to it. Go to church. Keep going to church every Sunday morning. Not pay that much of attention. Go through about your week. Come back. Just neglect it. These people had the Word, but they were thinking about neglecting it. Now I do want to point out here that when I'm saying that, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and go into it. This word, uh, well, I don't have it up there because I ran out of, ran out of room. <laughs> this word neglect in the original language uh, denotes a final action. So this verse in particular, it's not saying that if a man sins once, he's no longer saved. That's not what he's saying in this verse. This is denoting, uh, it's my understanding that the writer is conveying that one who quits Jesus finally and completely will be lost. And keep in mind the context here. These people were considering abandoning Christianity because of the present persecution. Things were so bad for them that they were considering going back to Judaism to escape this persecution. And Paul is saying here, if you do that, finally, done and final, you will be lost. Again, think about how that bears on once saved, always saved. These people were saved, but they will be lost if they neglect their salvation if they don't pay close attention and act accordingly. They believed that the word delivered by angels was valid, but now they were beginning to doubt this new revelation, kind of wondering what is so great about this salvation? If I'm enduring all this persecution, what's so great about this salvation? It doesn't seem like I'm being saved. And then with the next three phrases, the writer shows why this revelation is so great. And he gives three proofs that the gospel message is valid. It says it was declared at first by the Lord. There again, he's showing the supremacy of Christ over the angels because this came through the Lord. And it was attested to us by those who heard it. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So it says it was first spoken by the Lord. It was confirmed by those who heard it. And it was certified as from God by the miracles. That word confirmed there is a is a legal term that was the the same word as steadfast. These are both the same words in the original language and it's a legal term to confirm or um, to validate. So they believe the first message was valid. They were questioning this. But the writer says, it came through the Son of God. It was confirmed by those who heard it. What does that mean? It means... Remember, he's talking in legal language. So you've got multiple witnesses that heard Jesus say these things. And they're going away. And they're all telling the same story. So all three stories line up, just like in a court of law. And that confirms it. That validates the story. And it says it was... And then it was certified by God by miracles. So to prove that what these people were saying was from God. These people we assume to be the apostles. God, while they were preaching, while they were working, performed miracles to prove that what they were saying actually came from God. And it says various miracles. Uh, I kind of found that interesting. Did a little study on that. And what would you think if the apostles were coming around and every time they preached a message, and they would turn around, pop out, and pull money out of a hat, and put it back in. And every time they preached the message, they would go in and pull that same money out of a hat. 
Well, if you're doing the same thing over and over again, it's likely not a miracle. It's probably just a trick you learn how to do and you're doing it every time, right? No, that's not what they were doing. He says various miracles. It was random. It was all kinds of things. You could, there was no pattern you could put to it. Even further proof that these miracles were something supernatural. It wasn't just a trick. And you could get to that by logical conclusion if you saw what was happening there. So to summarize, I think what the writer is saying here and emphasizing is when God speaks through his son and then validates the message the way he did the gospel, that message must be given very close attention. And not just mental attention, we have to pay attention and act accordingly. Why? Because if you died for deliberately messing up or just not paying attention in the Old Testament, how much worse is it going to be for us if we neglect so great a salvation? That's the conclusion of my lesson this afternoon. Is there anyone who would like to make comment or question? No. Well, we don't want to close the service without offering an invitation. And I'd encourage you, if you've been... There's several questions you have to ask yourself if, if you haven't obeyed the gospel. One, where did we come from? Is there a God? That's the first question. And you really have to make that resolute in your mind. Make a decision one way or another because... Your entire life needs to be based off the answer, your answer to that question. And then once you answer that question, if you answer that God is real, then you ask yourself the question, well then, did God talk to us? Is there specific things He actually wants us to do? And that's what we believe here, we have here, is God's Word that He spoke through His Son. He actually manifested himself as a man and passed his word along to us. And then you have to ask yourself, well, is this actually that word? But if you've done all of those things and you believe that, then you have to consider accepting Christ as your king. I think the lesson itself was pretty good motivation. But if you know, you know. And we're told not to neglect that salvation. You can't get up to the, the judgment seat and say, well, I, I just didn't think it was that important. That falls under this. You can't know it's true, know it's important, and just not do it because then that falls under this. And we'll experience spiritual death. It's something extremely important and it affects our entire life. So we don't just need to go on not answering these questions because it's easier and we can do whatever we want and not really feel guilty about it. We need to answer these questions for ourselves. So if you know all of that to be true, I strongly encourage you, consider being baptized for the remission of your sins and start paying closer attention. Start acting according to what you read and what you learn. Because you're lost if you don't accept the gospel. And again, we'll be lost if we drift away, if we don't pay very close attention. Or if we have drifted away, if there's something that we've done of a public nature that needs to be corrected before the assembly, we've got that opportunity also to come while we stand and while we sing. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. 
In order to avoid that, click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So go ahead, do it, like right now, click on it.